Well, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you back. I'm not going to say much other than to hand, hand the, the virtual uh, uh, frame to Nagaya, who is a, an award-winning uh, author, so, uh, has been doing science and a whole range, as you can see, uh, journalist, broadcaster, author of Nomad Century. Gaia, over to you. Thank you for joining us and for helping, I suppose, um, in this conversation, setting the framework for this next session. Gaia, over to you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk to you this morning um, from London. Um, sorry, I can't be there. Or when I say um, morning, I suppose I mean afternoon for you in, um, in Brussels. Um, so I'll jump right into it. We are now living in the post-climate change world. What that means is that climate change is not something that we will experience um, at some point in the future, but it's something that is already here wherever you live in Europe and um, around the world. We've just had our first year um, with the temperature more than one and a half degrees above uh, the pre-industrial average. And ever since then, every single month has been higher, um, the highest um, ever recorded. Um, I'm just showing you this because the temperature rise last year was just so extraordinary. It really um, it, it confounded scientists who now think that um, t that um, carbon dioxide emissions that the um, temperature is more sensitive to carbon dioxide emissions than we first thought. Um, and so we are starting to see some really quite extreme conditions um, across the world. Uh, more than a thousand people died just this uh, week in the um, in the Hajj in in uh, Mecca, but we're also seeing uh, temperatures in the high 40s and 50s, and more importantly, nighttime temperatures being very high um, across the world. And that extra energy that we're seeing in the atmosphere is what is driving these heat waves, which sit on regions unrelentingly um, and causing these, these big issues. But they also cause much more violent storms um, and uh, flash flooding. More, hotter air holds more moisture, like we saw in Bavaria um, a week or so ago, um, as we've seen in northern Italy. So we are starting to see um, the European region already affected massively by fire, flood, drought, um, which affects agriculture, of course, and pushes up food prices, um, which enhances malnutrition um, if, if public health officials are not onto it in uh, the poorest parts of our regions. And um, we do have inequality across the European Union, of course, um, across the region. Across the world, we're seeing... Um, it, greater impacts. We're actually seeing starvation um, uh, from Sudan to Mali. There have been instances um, because of chronic drought. So um, in terms of the <clears throat> health impacts of what we're seeing, first of all, when um, infrastructure is affected and people are massively displaced, as increasingly is happening, you get issues of sanitation, you get issues um, and, and, and communicable diseases, you get um, uh, you get the um, issues that we normally see in, in very deprived uh, communities starting to affect a much wider population. And that occurs everywhere. This is the world's richest nation, the United States being hit by climate disaster. You see it everywhere. Um, so what we are what we are expecting to see um, by the end of the century is somewhere between at the moment uh, easily two and a half to four degrees uh, temperature rise above the pre-industrial average. That will have huge repercussions for livability across the planet. Making the Netherlands alone, we um, we expect to see a large portion of it. Um, rendered unlivable. Of course, we will uh, be doing our best to adapt many places, but, you know, we will have to have difficult conversations about where we retreat, uh, where we abandon, and where we bolster up with adaptation. Not everywhere will be livable. 
Um, if we look at the impacts at four degrees um, of uh, the multiple uh, impacts that we expect to see, which are fire, flood, heat and drought across the world, we see that the tropical region is the most affected. Um, as I said, everywhere will be affected with negative impacts, but places in the far north, um, much of Europe will be better able to adapt because the impacts will be lesser. Um, the places are wealthier and the populations um, generally have uh, better institutions and governance in order to enact the adaptations that will be required everywhere. So what we're expecting to see um, is uh, larger impacts across the tropics and that will drive migrations. Now, we're already seeing unlivable conditions um, and the impacts of that across the world. We're seeing a lot of deaths. In Europe alone, we have had um, more than 60,000 people just last year died only from uh, extreme heat. Uh, those, those numbers are going to rise. Um, particularly when we see these high wet bulb temperatures, and that's when heat and humidity are concerned. So that means that uh, the way that we cool ourselves down, the way that the body cools itself down, because we have to, we're mammals, we have to maintain a standard body temperature, um, is through evaporative cooling of our sweat. But when there is a certain amount of humidity and heat in the air, we cannot cool ourselves down anymore, and that becomes... Um, an issue with uh, the uh, survivability limit. And that survivability limit of wet bulb temperature has now been put down to somewhere between 25 and 28 degrees Celsius of a wet bulb temperature. And what that means is at that wet bulb temperature, even a young, healthy person who is not taking part in any activity will die within six hours. This is something that we absolutely need to prepare for. We need to have crisis centres. We need to have um, emergency planning for extreme heat in a way, in a similar way that um, hurricane prone areas have uh, hurricane alerts. Now, some countries have rolled out um, heat alerts, but it certainly hasn't been done in any coordinated fashion. And it needs to be much, much more coordinated so people know where to go. Um, wh where the air conditioned places are, particularly poorer members of society, and they include, of course, migrants. So what we are going to see is an increased migration north of, um, of uh, people uh, seeking safer places to live as the conditions become un unlivable over the century. Now, these migrant communities, of course, um, uh, they have uh, psychological needs as well as health needs. Um, their housing, healthcare, and um, all of that needs to be managed in a in a much more proactive fashion. And they will also um, be vectors for diseases that are also migrating north. So we're already seeing um, in Europe the uh, northward migration of the tiger mosquito, and this is a mosquito which carries dengue fever. Um, that is uh, a particular problem when you have. Um, uh, heat, hotter temperatures, when you have uh, densely populated um, communities, as you have in cities, which is where most people live, especially in Europe. And um, when you start having these standing waters from these flash floods that we're increasingly getting, we have drought and we have flash floods. And the, um, the combination of those leaves a lot of standing water because the, uh, the nature of these violent storms means that the water doesn't, the precipitation doesn't percolate through the soil in a, in a nice way, but um, causes, uh, causes damage to infrastructure. Um, and drainage can't cope. So we're going to start seeing incidents of dengue, also incidents of um, malaria. Uh, malaria used to be endemic all the way up to Sweden. Um, we did banish it um, decades ago across um, across Europe. This is a disease that is, um, is more prevalent in tropical regions with the higher temperature and standing water and dense populations, but it is also um, a disease of poverty. Um, and if we do not look after uh, the uh, needs of increasing numbers of uh, migrant and transient populations well, um, we will start to see uh, pockets of disease um, that, are, that are, you know, incubating in these um, impoverished communities. Just as we see tuberculosis in homeless communities, we will start to see um, more of those. 
sorts of diseases and malaria is an absolute prime example of that. The other thing is uh, sand flies, ticks carrying things like leishmaniasis, um, legionnaire, uh, other diseases that are starting to move north because of the temperature range, because we are now living in a different climate. Um, in terms of heat, we are already seeing um, an increase in heat deaths. A lot of this is adaptable with management um, and with planning. Um, it means making sure that people have access to cool places, they have the information, they are able to get um, uh, access to medical facility in a timeless, in a timely fashion, and um, that, you know, uh, that they're not feeling so marginalised that they don't seek help. Um, and I will finish soon because I know that I have a very brief time, but I will say that um, we have a lot of evidence now that links problems um, due to climate change with increased migration. And, and one of them, of course, is drought during the growing season, which means that food prices are out of the reach of ordinary people, forcing them to seek help elsewhere. This is just one paper which looked <coughs> short, saw a direct correlation between drought in the growing period in Mesoamerica, in Central America, and um, migration at the southern border. So how we deal with these issues, how we deal with our expanding human population really will determine how we manage public health going forward. We are not separate um, communities mm -hmm. of people who's, who have for generations been living in, the city, in one place. We are all um, of migratory roots. Um, we have uh, joint humanity. We need to make sure that we um, protect each other in order to protect our own health. Um, I'll stop there. Okay, um, thank you. And um, thank you very much uh, for for um, having me on to talk to you today. No, it's uh, a real pleasure. I mean, our session's going to be about, we're, we're going to be talking about the importance of connecting public health and climate change, you know, in terms of looking at uh, what, you've, what you've done uh, in, in a very um, sobering fashion um, and finally depressing fashion uh, is the damage we've done, we are doing to ourselves and its likely impact on especially the most vulnerable uh, uh, in our communities, regardless of where they are, and the fact that we're going to see a very different world being shaped in a relatively short period of time. Um, and Absolutely. I suppose, and public health yeah. is entirely... Um, is entirely um, integrated with environmental health. We can't separate those. So as we degrade our environment, we degrade our public health. And um, I don't think enough people recognise the, uh, the link The there. connection. Absolutely. So thank you for, for doing that and continue the good work. And, you know, here's looking forward to your new next new book, uh, which, again, will be, I'm sure, very, uh, you know, timely and sobering in, in its messages. But thank you for being with us. It's really appreciated.